Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irene. I'm the host here. And my guest today is a fellow YouTuber, Leanne Wilkinson, host of The Knitting Stew. And no, it's not the beef kind of stew. You are the stewardess. You are the flight attendant for an airline in Canada. Is yeah. There- that's it like a name of the airline. I just don't know if you want to. Um, there's only two major airlines in Canada, and I'm the one that's not red. <laughs> that's all I'll put it. <laughs> the other one. <laughs> the other one. So I told you before we started that I've been bitch watching you so much that my YouTube algorithm doesn't think there is anything else on YouTube and only recommends your videos to me now because you became like my absolute favorite. Like I've been watching you nonstop for the past couple months from first episode to like every little short you posted somehow, like it's always a pleasure to have you accompany me while I'm meeting. So (laughs) I feel like we haven't met, we've never spoken until now. And I feel like you're one of my best friends, you know? (laughs) <laughs> so I gotta I gotta mention my husband's like why do I keep getting all these knitting podcasts on my YouTube <laughs> so I was like maybe it's because you watch me but right. I honestly would I thought it was just going to be like my family members and friends that watched my channel so and I remember seeing that in one of the earlier episodes you were like I know it's only my family and friends who are watching it and hi everybody yeah. love you but like if somebody by chance by mistake stumble on my channel and here we are 10,000 subscribers later did you expect that oh my gosh no I didn't and I have a pretty big family (laughs) but it's um it's actually overwhelming when I think about like hitting 10k recently I thought wow that is I never anticipated that well, no, tell me, like, what all. made you what made you decide to start the YouTube channel? Because it's not like you're bored, like you busy. Yeah, woman. yeah I I think um, for me, I'd watched other podcasters that really uh, resonated with me, and uh, I I spent like you say keeping company, right? And um, like Inga from Knitting Traditions, I'd watch her videos in the evening, and it would just calm me, and. Uh, you know, Amy Palco, people like that, I I would watch them and be very inspired. And also, I I think when I got, I was on layoff for quite a while during the COVID crisis, and I was seeking community. And I found that. And like one another podcaster had said one time, she's like, I just I want to talk back. (laughs) So she's watching these podcasters. And she's like, I want to talk back. And that that inspired me, because I, I wanted to also be that person that could could knit along with other people so that's why I did it well I remember my very first interview so the way that happened I was actually doing it over live on Instagram like I was thinking that like I have all these followers and I don't really know anybody well so what if I just go live with somebody and ask a couple questions and that's how it started and then I moved to YouTube channel and so if you look at my first interview I mean, I had a blast. I was also a nervous wreck. I didn't know what I'm doing. I didn't know what I'm going to ask. It was like totally unprepared because I asked Josh Stein. I was like, Josh, like, what do you think about this idea? And he was like, let me just have a piece of cake and then we can go and do it. So there was like no prep, no time. Love like, it. I don't even know how to go live, right? Tell me about your first episode. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly it if you, if, <laughs> and I've I've often thought about like should I leave that one up there but it it's so funny because I did the same thing I I actually say that in that episode it's like I was just prompted it's like today's the day there's nothing special about that day but today's the day so I just you know got got in front of the camera and I thought let's see how awkward it actually is and I just started chatting and it and um, we had my knitting with me and while I was nervous, I kind of, I thought, you know, I'm just going to introduce who I am and, and might delete later. <laughs> but I, so that's, I like to launch in, and that's kind of how I do things sometimes. I, it's better to not have too much information sometimes. Like if I had known how long it was going to take me to edit every video, <laughs> I would have been like, holy moly, there's a lot to this. Right. Ignorance is bliss, as they say. <laughs> so well, that's one of the things that always like makes me curious you travel somewhere for like th- you have like three four days when you travel so there's like a little overlay and that's when you go around and you like film where you are and you film some yarn stores and you talk and you film yourself right 
But like oftentimes you have all you're needing with you and um, and there's like little frog that comes with you and, <laughs> and all the like little hats and stuff. Like how do you pack? Like do, when you pack, do you already know that you're going to be filming your next episode and you're like, okay, forget about toothbrush, but the frog has to come. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, I brought my knitting, but I forgot my shoes. Uh, yeah, there's a little planning involved for sure. I, I joke because uh, but I get that question a lot, like, how do you bring all of what you're bringing with you? And it is uh, 100% that the plan is to podcast and when I have the things that I have with me. So my suitcase is like a clown car. Like, you know, there's just stuff that just keeps on coming out of it. And um, I actually have filmed a little video about how I pack and what I'm doing, uh, how I get it there. But people um, sometimes don't understand how long we do fly. Like we can fly up to five days. So that the suitcase and stuff that I bring is that's my home for five days. So we have a normal size suitcase, like a most traveler carry on suitcase. But we also have like a, a business satchel as well. That's my secret sauce right there is that I can push my clothing, a dress, a change of clothes, workout wear, that kind of thing. And then my suitcase, it's all the knitting. It's, it's my tripod. It's my finished objects. It's the yarn I'm bringing. Um, yeah, and they expand, so that's a good thing. <laughs> so, well, so I can't forget about, my toothbrush. Let's talk about knitting. Like, how did it start? What does it mean in your life? Like, what role it plays? A very big role, and it's uh, sh shocking to me. It's like it's my lifestyle. Like every time I close my eyes, and um, my sister taught me. I have very creative siblings and my sister Wendy taught me when I was about I think around 11 years old or so elementary age and she taught me how to garter stitch and she taught herself and you know off that was that and then in 2006 <clears throat> yeah 2006 the summer of that year um, I was struggling with some things and I was at her cabin and she had her knitting needles there and I was like oh you taught me how to do that can you cast on for me? And I'll, and I sat there and I knit and I knit and I knit and I couldn't cast off, <laughs> but it was still there, right? The muscle memory. I'm uh, like, I'm, I was curious about that because like, to me, it was the same thing. Like my grandma taught me how to knit when I was probably like seven or eight, like one summer that I was spending with her. And I think I knew how to cast on, but I definitely didn't know how to cast off. And I only knew like right. and pearl. And I only needed for like those few weeks when she taught me and yeah. then I came back to it like six years ago and it was like I never stopped knitting it was like right there really, it was right yeah. there yeah I, isn't that amazing that's like I, I actually I insisted on teaching my I bribed to teach both of my children how to knit when they were little so my son must he wanted like a Hot Wheels car and I was like <laughs> okay well just we're gonna knit a couple rows and my daughter also she'd actually made herself a little cowl we called it with a hole in it so you could put a button through and so they both have that in there in there you know it's somewhere in those memory banks but she she had taught me and it came back very quickly and honestly that um I never stopped since like I went hardcore right away well you did go hardcore because like when I'm looking at your needs it's like all over the place I mean you do stranded color you're doing color work you're doing like all different kinds of things like every project is very different and I feel like you like that's my impression right that you like to mix yeah. like really big complicated projects with something like almost silly like something yeah you know that yeah. Brings a smile. Mm -hmm. yeah and I think for um when I was kind of thinking about my journey as a knitter um my early projects so from 2007, 2008, the early 2000s were mostly toys and things for my kids, or they would ask for something, you know, random, something from Speed Racer, my son wanted a ball. And, but then all of a sudden I was like, oh, I'm going to try a cardigan. And the weird thing is that like, I didn't know what I was doing, but I lived only seven minutes from a local yarn shop and I would go there and the owner, uh, Mona, she was an incredible knitter and she would she would help me like she's like she she kind of would guide me although I took no formal training and I spent a lot of time on um knittinghelp.com <laughs> I don't know if anybody else remember those videos look so old but I'm like oh that was quite a while ago those videos were made 
that, that oh. helped me with techniques. <laughs> What's your learning approach now? Because you just told me that you like you learn increases uh, and decreases from uh, Suzanne Bryant's uh, channel. Yes. Yeah, yeah, YouTube. Oh, you know, very pink nets and Suzanne Bryant. I do find that I get really comfortable in something and then I don't push myself out of the comfort zone. So I will get inspired by something that I see and then go, yeah, but I don't know how to do that. And there's certain techniques that I, I will readily admit that I avoid. But I think once I get to that place where I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to sit here and learn this. It's okay. And there's so many resources. So I, I can kind of rest on my laurels at times and do what I know. And then, but it's some, sometimes it's time to grow. Right. So I'm, I'm actually at that place right now. And like, I need to push myself into learning ladder back jacquard um, for some knitted color work I want to do. And also I've never ever done um, brioche yeah, and I want to learn. <laughs> right. I'm like, why am I so scared? Of that? And like my I, prediction, I have drip. <laughs> my prediction is that um, Stephen West's uh, MCAL this year <laughs> will have brioche. So we have to prepare you for that. Right. Because you're participating. <laughs> Nothing can prepare me for Stephen West <laughs> middle As well, you see, last year didn't go well. <laughs> the beauty of his uh, MCAL that, I mean, last year was my very first time trying it. Mm -hmm. And what I found that he shows everything and anything in his videos. So it's so detailed that there is like no room for misunderstanding. Like you will yeah. get the way he does. He holds it. your hand that whole way through. It's It's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I w one of the other thing that we sort of briefly talked about before we started this interview is how you and I are very different in our approach to Ravelry. You take very detailed notes, you put all your information, all the modifications, and I'm treating Ravelry as the necessary evil sort of like the only time I'll put anything there is if I'm test eating for somebody. Otherwise, I much rather need, right? Tell me about that cue that I keep on hearing. So you mentioned mm -hmm. cue in your videos quite often. Is how like how disciplined you are with the cue? <clears throat> My cue is um, it's a, it's a what's what's got my attention now. And there's some things that have been in that cue for a long time. They're my dreams. Like it's it's going to be there. And it is fluid. I will say that I'm not that strict. The things that I am strict about with my Ravelry, um, and I've just been like that since day one. Someone told me about Ravelry in 2007, 2008, and I, I've been on it since then. So um, the rest of my life is kind of a wing and a prayer. <laughs> but my knitting is extremely organized. So I, I log those things because I've had a situation where I made something that I loved and didn't have those notes to go back on and so I I get on there and I will plan a project plan the yarn plan all these things and I keep it I, I keep it right up to date to the best of my ability and I just regularly go through that queue and sometimes things bump up <laughs> it's like that looked like fun but now it's summer um so we'll put that one at like 10 or whatever and I'll move up my summer knits or yeah so there's about I think I have 55 things in my queue right now <laughs> when I'm going to get the time to do all those, but generally one, two, and three are probably within like the next few months. Well, let's talk about it because to me, when a person has like typical podcasts, right? And by typical podcast, I mean like there is this uh, talking about finished object, talking about the what's on your needles, talking about future plans, the acquisitions, that kind of thing, right? That kind of format. I'm always wondering if that forces you into working on mul like multiple pro projects just so that you can talk about something in the next podcast. Do you feel like you're being pressured by the podcast into casting on more and more? Oh, holding me accountable, right? That's the thing. I, uh, yeah, because as I, I started out primarily as a monogamous knitter and I felt very happy about checking things off the list and I have learned that because I'm so motivated right now and it's, it's not just, you know, to provide content, but I really, I feel like I just found my serious knitter mojo and, and, and specifically it's garments. 
because I knitted so many accessories for so many years, toys for my kids, those kinds of things, that I feel um, the need to have those side projects now rather than just like work on a sweater, work on one thing. So yeah, it has completely uh, changed how I approach my knit. So I actually, I'm still not comfortable with anything over like more than three items on the go would really uh, cause me some anxiety up here, right? So I will have three bags and that's usually my maximum, maximum, yeah. So that's that's what I do, yeah. Does it surprise you? Because like this is what I'm finding about myself and I feel like we are very similar in this respect. Does it surprise you that like when people think about knitting, they're thinking, oh, it's just this hobby, like when they don't have anything else to do, they just make something. And for us, it's not really a hobby, it's more of an obsession. And yeah. to the point when like, you know, people get on the way of your knitting, basically, like you might try to make them go out to like do other things. Like you, you have to remind yourself that it's a hobby, right? Do you, I mean, is that the way you feel? I'm among my, my people. I knew that right away when I was, yeah, started that YouTube channel is that it is, um, where does that come from? Like, it, it's just in, incredible how powerful the desire to knit is. So um, actually as someone who has struggled with addiction in the darker sense, it is very similar to the mental obsession. Like, I can't wait to get to that. I can't. So I use it as motivation for me. Like, um, like for example, I started knitting uh, two years before I started flying. And when it was time for my training, my ground school, which is extremely intense, I had my, I had a knitting project that was like, this is my prize. Like when I get through training and I'm like certified, then I can knit that. So I would, like, I seriously would use it as, um, you know, a, a treat to myself. And when I get a lot of conversations with like my fellow crew members or like anyone on board who starts, oh yeah, that's, that's a fun little hobby. Um, and then I explain to them what did I like if, if I have those chats with my crew members we we become very close friends and in, in three or four days they're like I had no idea that knitting was like that and I usually start with like do you know how many like we have Ravelry and I explain what Ravelry is and they're like whoa I had no idea <laughs> so my family understands the obsession because <laughs> they're they, they like well like every time you start talking about knitting they just back away slowly like <laughs> <laughs> uh oh well, it took a little while for um, my husband, but now he actually requests items like he he likes my knits and he always did. But his grandma knit, he's British. And, uh, you know, he's got the typical grand sweater, you know, grand sweater and stuff, those kinds of scratchy things in mind. But uh, yeah, my, my daughter likes my knits. Uh, my son, will he'll wear my toques and he'll request them. So that's kind of nice to have them. Um, but when they were young, it was hard. Like I think a lot of maybe young moms uh, start knitting and it's such a beautiful distraction and then they're like but I'm raising a family here <laughs> so we can only go to the park for so long but me knitting and letting you just run rampant right <laughs> it's so comforting tell me about your yarn choices because like that's one of my favorite part of watching you seeing what you pick why because like you go into details it's very thought through process it's not just like oh pretty like come with me home Mm. I learned that the hard way. <laughs> I really did learn that the hard way <laughs> because I have a yarn. Um, I'm trying to really focus on my stash. And I see how that is because being a, an accessories knitter, it was always fine to buy one skein because I was like, oh, I'll make a hat with that or I'll make a cowl or whatnot. Um, and now my knitting choices, um, I think it, we always learn from that mistake. And I had made uh, what I thought was just the most beautiful garment. Um, it was, I think it was Uni Jang who designed it. It was this a while ago, but I'd made it with superwash. And when I put it on and the way it hung on me, I was like, oh my gosh, that was, I got gauge. What's wrong here? So learning a bit more about the actual fibers. And that's where my yarn choices have changed where, what I didn't like. So then when I have something that I do like, I like Blue Face Lester, um, and I and I have that experience and I want to find other types that are very similar in property to that. So I find I do actually like a bit rustic, uh, a bit rustic wool, which is interesting. 
but I'll also swing right over and, and get right into something super squishy and soft. That's um, yeah. So I, I'm I kind of all over map that way. Yeah. You, I've done uh, fiber curious, right? I think a lot of us are fiber curious. I, I like so that. We'll, yeah. We'll see, we'll see somebody put something out on, on like a podcast or whatnot or on Instagram and be like, that's very interesting. So I'll kind of try and seek it out depending on what city I'm in. And <clears throat> I have found, um, I dove into the unspun yarn pretty deep. I saw that. I'm like, I'm, yeah. I actually went yesterday to a local yarn store and they had the unspun yarn and I was like standing yeah. there and I'm like, well, Leon likes it. Maybe I should get it. It is very, it is very interesting that I, <clears throat> I was like, I really, I think I, I used to do very chunky knits and I found they were so heavy. Right. And I was like, man, I'd love to make a quick knit, but it's like, they're just too heavy. And so then the unspun sort of blew my mind. And for the smell alone, Oh my gosh, <laughs> like my yarn cover smells like unspun yarn. So I, I made a few projects with it and I have a couple more uh, on my queue to use up that stash. But I've, I've had that, I'm, I've been there, done that, and I won't probably go down that rabbit hole again. Yeah. So, no, and it's funny because like, yeah. I think like maybe that was the moment when I felt like we were connected at some level because when I saw you pulling that unspun yarn and just immediately <laughs> sniffing it, I was like, this is my kind of girl. I'm like, why? Why do we do that? Um, I, I really do like the sheepy smell and and I, I definitely think there's something very, <laughs> it's, a core, it's a core pleasure. I love it. Yeah, the smell of yarn. So when you started the YouTube channel, you were talking to your family and friends. You thought they were the ones who were watching you. So you were sort of sharing your story. Who are you talking to now? Who is your audience mm. in mind? I'm talking to like Arena now, you know, and 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 I, I'm talking to my sister, Wendy. Um, I had a, a podcaster who she started her own channel. She's like, I did it. I jumped out. I decided to do it. And like, what do you suggest? And I, and I say, I suggest that you, when you share your nets, um, just be you, but also just like pretend you're talking to that one person that, you know, vibes with you. Right. So this, this is it. Because if, if I try and talk from a place of like, what's everybody going to want to know about this? It's that's too overwhelming. And, and now um, I can't even explain well, you probably understand that you get you get people who comment on your on your videos and you, you realize that you have connected with that person uh, in a different way that you didn't even recognize because they're very specific about some of their comments and things that they say. And that's again, I keep that in mind when I think, uh, or, you know, we can get highly critical of ourselves. I, I think a lot of us can. And for me, I'm like, you know, I'm not going to edit that out. Like, I don't know what I was talking about there, or where I was going, but perhaps I was. <laughs> Perhaps I was jet lagged um, or that came across weird, but I'm going to leave it because I think I seek authenticity in people. And when I like we're we're a mixed lot and I don't think anyone's perfect. And so if I if I thought my podcast had to be perfect, uh, I probably would have like stopped at episode one. <laughs> so I, I do try and just keep in mind, like because I know my sister Wendy watches on her lunch break at work. So I'm still talking to her, but I've got some. Like, I feel like there's 10,000 fiber friends out there. I really do. You remember ever, like, your first celebrity moment when you went somewhere and somebody recognized you? <laughs> oh, my God. I That is um, a really good memory, actually, because I went to the Edmonton Fiber Frolic with my sister and my friend Tracy. And uh, there was a lady who was um, her sister and her were both, they watched the podcast and and I think I had a, like maybe 3,000 followers at that time. And they ran up and they're like, the Nitty Stew. Oh my gosh, we're so <laughs> glad to meet you. Um, we love your podcast. My sister couldn't come from Saskatchewan. Can we get a selfie with you? Oh my gosh. I was like, this is hilarious. And I love it. I love it. Love it. So um, yeah, that was the first time that happened in November. Of well, last one year. of the episodes, you were saying that. Somebody reached out to you knowing that you're coming to like some city and they wanted to meet up and you just didn't have the energy and, mm -hmm. the, you know, to go and meet in person. And you were like very yeah. apologetic for that, but it was what was best for you. Mm -hmm. 
do you how open are you with your viewers like how much of your life do you let them in mm. yeah you know i i've actually had a fair bit of time to think about that because um as as a flight attendant i'm out there a lot like yesterday i interacted with over 300 people so i do find when i get to my destination in my overnight city oh do i love to just retreat and introvert and knit like that chair over there that's i'm going to be sitting in there for a few hours if the fog doesn't clear here in newfoundland <laughs> um so i love to connect with people and on instagram too like a lot of people dm me and send me direct messages and i like that a lot I don't feel in any way um, unsafe by any of that interaction because knitters are the best, right? Like they're, they're so good. Um, but I do sometimes feel that maybe I wouldn't have, and, and I admitted that in that one episode is that I was just like, I, I just need to retreat, even though I'm here for, you know, 24 hours or what, however long I was there. Um, but I am not opposed to like, let's meet up, let's have coffee. And, and sometimes, um, I think that's going to happen in the future and I, I'm okay with that. I'm, I like having a large circle, but I'm also, uh, I do have that need to retreat. I'm an introvert. I re recharge. I, like I slept for 10 hours last night and I just woke up just before, before this interview and I was like, I just slept for 10 hours. Woo. So now I'm good to go. Right. So yeah, I think that, I hope that answers your question is that I, I would like to welcome a community And in each city, it just really depends upon the circumstances of how much I've been flying um, and if I do need to retreat or not. I think people understand that. Um, I hope they do. Yeah. Do you ever feel like the YouTube owns you, sort of, that there is this pressure of being consistent, the pressure of constantly like coming up with the content that doesn't matter how you feel, if you're in the mood or not in the mood, You promised that episode and somebody is waiting. So you have to like pull yourself together and do it. I felt, I definitely felt that in the first um, six to nine months of doing, the, doing the podcasts and uh, YouTube, the, the way it shows you uh, views and statistics and uh, it really wants you to know how things are doing. But I really feel that this is my podcast. And if there's any like the success or what, what success kind of thing is, is that I, I just want to keep my primary purpose there. And that was to connect with other people um, in a genuine way, like what's actually bringing me joy, what's exciting. So to stick to a, a schedule for me is that's, it, it's all based around if I can get a long enough overnight anywhere. So I don't feel that pressure anymore. I've actually taken that off of myself and just, uh, I just go with it. And if I have to explain in my next video, it's like, you know, it's been whatever, four to six weeks before my last episode. It's literally because that is, that was all I could manage. And, um, and I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm really okay with that. It, whatever happens, like I said, I, I thought there was like going to be my family members and maybe some of my lovely nieces watching. And now I have people who, um, you know, just are genuinely excited about where she's going to be next. You know, that's fun. Life needs to be fun. Does it surprise you the variety of people who are watching you? Because like when I'm looking at yes. my um, analytics, right, and it shows me that I have people in South Africa, in New Zealand, in Australia, like all over the world, yeah. like literally all over the world watching my channel. I can't even comprehend it. Like it's it's something like I know that it's true, but I just can't even register it. Like to me, it's <laughs> mind blowing. I know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think this is the beauty of the YouTube community is it is so vast. Um, and, you know, when people first started saying hi, I'm saying hello from New Zealand or I'm, I'm over here in the Netherlands. Like I was really like, I'm doing a roll call here because <laughs> I'm so excited that people are watching this from around the world. And yet what that's also proven is that we're so similar. Like those, the comments that they make, um, you know, like, I like Caitlin Hunter too, or, you know, even though I've never been to Canada, um, my, my sister lives there, or like, we just find that commonality and that kind of stuff. And the age, um, the age thing too. So my demographics, 
uh, I was looking at it, who's watching your channel and I'm like, all right, well, I, I'm, I'm kind of a hit with the 50 to 60 crowd. <laughs> I was like, all right, sweet, let's go. Um, and I hope that when I'm like, say I have some people in their seventies and eighties, the a couple of ladies in particular, I'm thinking of from the UK. Like if I'm in my eighties and I'm watching YouTube and knowing how to operate this, you know, device, I'm like, that's, that's fabulous. So it but does do you blow see my mind. yourself going indefinitely with YouTube? Like, do you think it's going to be part of your life forever and ever now? That's a good question. You know, I've thought about that. Um, because part of my shtick is visiting overnight cities. And while, you know, we have um, the airline that I work for, we have like over 100 and I think 107 destinations, different countries. Uh, we go all over. But sticking within Canada, there's only so many cities here. So what do I do when I've gone to all the cities? So I've actually asked myself that question. Um, and I did open up to another podcaster and they said, well, we'd be okay if you go back to the same city. And I was like, okay, well, all right. Um, and apparently it's not just about the cities, but I think that's a big part of it. So I think I'll just continue to go until it, if it runs its course. Um, yeah. So I haven't really got an answer if this will how, how long I'll do this. Where do, do podcasters stop podcasting? Like, I don't know. Um, someone I'm thinking of in particular is um, the gentle knitter who is a, a Canadian uh, podcaster, just delightful. And I think there's some health issues that have occurred with this person and that's, um, that's where it's gone. But what I can say is that if, if I have to like not do the podcast, um, there will be a good communication regarding it because I feel very connected to the, to the people who subscribe. Talking about Canada, I'm learning so much through your channel because it's almost yeah. like uh, a Wikipedia sort of presentation. Like you'll talk about the indigenous people, you'll talk about the history, how, the population, the like what what the city is famous for. Um, are you learning new things? <laughs> I am loving this so much. So where I found myself in like say 2010 is that I would feel guilty coming to my hotel room and not exploring properly you know I'm like here in this great beautiful place I'm in St. John's Newfoundland yes I would go out maybe get a you know a bite to eat but not really investigate and now this channel has definitely motivated me to learn about each and every city I go to and I and then I come home and I have all these weird fun facts to tell my husband about <laughs> Winnipeg and <laughs> I was like, did you know Edmonton, blah, blah, blah. And that kind of thing is, it's very nationalistic to me. It makes me feel very proud to be in this country and to have such a diverse variety of cities. And the histories are, you know, somewhat dark in some some cities. And yet there's like fun facts that I like to throw in there. <laughs> about like why garbage collection started in Winnipeg is because a horse died in the street. Like yeah. stuff like that is, I think it's very fun and quirky but it's also yes I've become a bit of a fact seeker um <laughs> thanks to doing this for each and every city I'm learning a lot you have a favorite places to go oh I'm here right now I'm here right now so uh Newfoundland I wish I could sh that it's literally the fog is ticked by is what they would say it's 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 all foggy here today but this uh this island of Newfoundland is definitely a favorite place of mine. Mm, I got in yesterday around supper time. So uh, just exploring this uh, maritime place, it's definitely my favorite. Uh, my, I, I wore my, my ranunculus, which is, this is from the yarn I bought here. So when I walk around, it's it was from a dyer out here, windswept fibers. And, and that's the, colors the second of it, ranunculus, right? This is my second ranunculus. <laughs> there may be a third. I mean, I only needed one skein of uh, one and a bit skein to make the long sleeve version of it. And um, that, thank goodness, because that yarn shop's no longer downtown here. It has moved way out in in uh, Triton, Newfoundland. But this is one of my favorite cities for sure. And then um, I'd say uh, Victoria is also a favorite. It's a beautiful place. So that's one coast to the other coast, right? And then oh, when, I also when, when you explore a city, when you come to a, a city, like, is not going to the yarn store ever an option? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I make it a priority. I really do. Um, 
but it, it is, uh, it can be challenging at times because there's some cities don't have uh, good access to like to transit or if I had to Uber or if it's just too far from where we stay, that, that can be tricky. So um, I think that would be okay. Like I could still just go and explore what's around me and not have to go to the yarn shop, but I really do want to go to the yarn shop. Uh, and that's and just I mean, like if I people do. haven't watched your channel, you actually mentioned walking for 45 minutes to get to the yarn shop. <laughs> yeah. In Halifax, you can totally do that. Right. It's, just a, it's a beautiful place to walk around. Uh, yeah. And I think it seems to me as I plan my episodes, mm, there's usually a yarn shop within 20 minutes or so. So I did not realize that that's, fairly rare like people from the UK they they will message sometimes and say I can't believe you are in a place where there's like five local yarn shops right. and I'm like yeah it's it's good right it's thriving here in Canada I'd say I think the knitting world and the wool industry in general is starting to get a lot of momentum yeah I feel like I'm very lucky in where I live because there is like at least 20 yarn stores within like 40 minutes oh, <laughs> oh I need to come I need to yeah, come down there within like 10 minutes you know so it's uh, like really that's dangerous too that's yeah. dangerous too what, what we are finding too here in Canada is that some uh yarn shops are start having to start online because the cost of a brick and mortar shop right now is it's pretty intense um but I have seen some that have started online and then got the real deal so yeah, I, I hope these businesses will thrive. And if I don't, you know, stay so committed to my own stash, <laughs> we gotta keep we gotta keep these uh, yarn shops going. Well, we talked about a little bit about definition of success, right? What success actually means? Mm. Are you with me on the same page that like once you get free yarn from somebody, this is the, your definition <laughs> of success? <laughs> That's it. I have reached the pinnacle of success. <laughs> Um, oh, I was absolutely starstruck when Pearl Soho sent me yarn. Like, come on, right? Um, I mean, I would say like, oh. like <laughs> when it arrived, I'm like, ah, Dave, my husband, come look at this. This is from this is from Pearl Soho. Um, and it's it's actually again, it's that fiber curiosity. Like, I want to see how much free yarn I can get. I'm genuinely interested in that the unique stuff that I've never worked with before. Um, so th that has happened. Um, it, ha it has happened recently. Someone had messaged me, um, but I, I really, I, I want to be mindful about my stash now, now that I know what I like. You um, are a strong so woman if you can say no to free yarn. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't easy. <laughs> I was like, I really don't need that. Um, yeah. <laughs> so okay. I mean, whoever is listening, you can send it to me. I'll never <laughs> say no. <laughs> I'll find what to Absolutely. do. And that's the funny part, like, because I don't think I've met yarn that I don't like. And even when I uh, buy yarn that I have zero idea of what I'm going to do with, somehow, like, one day I come and it just, like, screams my name and I'll find, like, a perfect <laughs> for that yarn. So I know none of it is going to waste, you know? Oh, my gosh. You'll give it a happy home. Absolutely. You'll give it a happy home. That's so good. Oh, my gosh. How much do you plan ahead? Like, are you already know because of that queue, right? Like, do you already know everything you're knitting this year? Um, I have some must knits because there's they've there's things that have caught me that I that I go look at. Like, I look at that project and I have the yarn for. So, uh, things come across my radar though. That just like whoop, they take me. I'm like, oh no, you're right now. But I've allowed myself. Uh, thank you. Like through through this YouTube channel, it's been like I'm allowed to cast something on, and to deviate. I used to be very rigid in so many things that that um, yeah. So I would stick to that and plan and have all that. But I like recently I had a um, a knit along come across my my youtube feed and then i was like oh okay through uh the rainbow knit along so then i got rainbow yarn and made some rainbow socks that's what yes. happened with this show <laughs> i went to the yarn <laughs> store and the designer was showing that show and i was like oh my god this is so pretty and she's like you want to need it and i'm like absolutely so the next day exactly. I just <laughs> <laughs> this is how we are right I, I don't think we can commit sometimes but there are there are like three things that will 
100% be on my finished objects before the end of 2023. <laughs> what I need to stop doing, Irina, is subscribing to all these newsletters. Because I, I subscribe to every newsletter, every newsletter. And then I and then they send like, oh, this is an example that we have in the shop. And and then my queue gets longer. <laughs> No, that's my it's frustration. Fun. Like, I, I wish I had, like, the eight sets of arms, you know, so I could, like, yes. eat everything I want to eat. Yeah, I know. That is the struggle, isn't it? And I feel very, uh, a lot of us right now in the knitting world are, like, have a ton of cast on itis. Like, we just, and that, for me, at this time of year, it's, you know, summer, spring here right. is unusual. But everyone I talk to is, like, wanting to make all the things. Are there days when you're not knitting? No. You see, like, no. I, I put that as a, in my header on Instagram, never not knitting. Because we're not knitting. Honest. That's the best hashtag and the best thing ever. There, It's very, very rare. And I find I get grumpy. Like, Leah, somebody give Leanne her knitting and, <laughs> and put her in a timeout. Um, and I, it's, it's very real to me that I just like, oh, I need to soothe myself. And I have other ways of, you know, meditating and grounding and exercise and uh, when I eat well and sleep well, but there's something about the left, right comfort of knitting in my brain. And I don't, um, I wanted to like uh, sit down with myself and be like, well, I, I don't have other crafts that I do. Like I, I've dyed a bit of yarn here and there. Uh, you know, I know how to do simple embroidery, but you know, I'm not into the other crafts. So knitting is like, my obsession and my soul love. <laughs> I should probably very a little bit, maybe. I don't know. You evolved as a YouTuber. You evolved as a knitter. You're learning new skills and new things. How do you feel like you change as a person? Mm. Let's see. I'm going to, hmm. When it comes to being, um, uh, I guess I just have started to step into my myself, my power, what I can and can't do. And and I, I just had my 50th birthday. And I feel that um, maybe for the first mm, 38, 35, those not that many years, I, I sort of did what I thought I was supposed to do, what was expected. And now as a, now I like to just, I like to throw stuff a little razzle dazzle out there and just just do me, um, regardless of what people are expecting and and what what is yeah it's I feel a sense of freedom. That's how I feel like I've evolved as a person. I love that. that you know it like that, I, yeah. I love uh, that. Like this is exactly uh, how I feel. <laughs> I feel I like I'm, I'm finally into stepping this. into my skin. You know. Yeah, and I and I that's what I see is my with my my knitting has always just led me to. Uh, you know, the next level in my evolution of like, what do I actually like? But it's usually a, an event. Uh, like I, I have some knitting milestones. I had someone request a, a cowichan sweater from me and for their 40th birthday. And I was like, that's way beyond my skill set. And it really was. But then forcing myself to do it. And now I can't imagine not doing color work. Like I think about color work all day long. I love it. So that event changed that. So um, I'm hoping there's not going to be another like major event that really makes me step into my power because I feel like I'm slowly just getting there with a little bit of experience. I always wanted a little brioche shawl if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> it's you. You're going to push me into that. The brioche sphere. Why do I have that? I'm not sure. I don't know. But yeah. Well, the first time I did a brioche scarf, like I knitted for probably six months at that time. So that was like my whole experience in knitting. And I saw brioche scarf and I was like, I really like the way it looks. And a friend of mine had a birthday and I was like, I'm going to make it for him. And so there was a deadline mm -hmm. and, and it took me 18 times unraveling it completely and the one of the times it was like I was almost two thirds done and I had to unravel oh I couldn't catch the, I, I didn't know how to fix the mistakes and I didn't know how to catch the stitches like and now it seems so silly because like now I can fix those mistakes right and it seems so yes. easy so yeah like it's it's a little bit tricky to first learn yeah 
But there yeah. are so many videos of how to fix mistakes that it's like, I just didn't even think about watching those videos. So I learned the hard way, but I'm sure you can like research it and like make it easy. <laughs> you must have really liked that friend, first of all. And, you know, I wish ignorance again, if I didn't know, like one of the first things I made was an intarsia pirate sweater for my son. Yeah. Like, intarsia could have kept me. I know people have just started trying intarsia. I was like, I did that in my first year because I didn't know <laughs> the technique or didn't yeah, know what I, I didn't like know. Ignorance <laughs> is like it equals freedom in this respect. Like when you know, the f when you don't know that you're supposed to be intimidated by something. Yes. You just step right in without being intimidated and somehow you figure it out, you know? Yes, I, I agree. There's a, I used to teach a, a hat class at a local yarn shop and the person that was taking the class was very nervous about our cast on. And uh, I was like, oh, okay. She's like, I tried before and it was like, it was really, really hard because she'd already taken a learn to knit class and <laughs> right. she started showing me what she learned and they had taught her the Norwegian cast on. <laughs> Like with one hand, right. she would do a knit stitch. And I was like, oh my gosh. So that is a highly advanced technique for a beginner knitter. And here, you know, some people don't know what they know, but. <laughs> yeah, that took me a while to learn myself. It's not the yeah, easiest it's cast on. Yeah. It's very yeah, Provisional. Uh, I'm still a provisional cast on. I later. saw the most brilliant uh, tutorial on uh laura nelkin's uh instagram yesterday how to do provisional cast mm -hmm. it, it was like absolutely revolutionary you have to go and watch that it's okay i've never seen anything clever more clever than that she's using you know those um what do you call them like they extenders that you can put on your needles and then like slip the stitches onto them and they oh. i just like i'm blanking and it's the held on the on the right so cord? she starts oh. the provisional cast on on that cord and then she just puts the tip of the needle into that and slides all the stitches onto the needle. It's like so brilliant. <laughs> no picking out, no crochet. Right. right. Oh, I like that. See, now look, I put myself out there and talk to you about like not doing brioche and not doing provisional cast on. Hey, so now, yeah. <laughs> now you you'll, you'll keep me in, in check. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, when you talk to people who watch your channel, are you surprised by the like what they tell you? Like, are you ever learning something from them? Like from the from their response to your episodes? Um, I I have had some pretty, I think, beautiful moments like with what people share, with what actually they find. Um, what what moves them in the video or like in whatever I've shared about or. Um, and just a lot of encouragement. And I, I am actually surprised at um, so people have to sit that I think that connection thing, the connection, like what, what connected them to my video. Um, and when they share those things with me, that is what has kept me going out. Like I love exploring, but I, I also realize that um, there's a craving for people to explore this beautiful country that I live in. And that is, um, that surprises me that, I mean, it shouldn't surprise me. Canada is beautiful, but where people have had such a curiosity, like that's on my bucket list. Like people will tell me like they want to go to Banff, Alberta, Canada. And that's 45, an hour and 45 minutes from my house. And I'm like, I, maybe I should get out there and, and showcase. So how I've become that person, um, it, that, that surprises me because I, I, I've never done videography before. And I love that's, it. That's so funny because like, okay, that's my next question for you. Because when you started with this YouTube channel, you never did videography. You didn't know anything about editing. It's It was like all learn as you go, right? Yeah. Do you see yourself going full time into knitting as a profession at some point when you're done with flying? Knitting? Like be a professional knitter? Oh, I would love like that. You're a designer, <laughs> any of those things. Okay, so one thing I have learned is uh, I should never say never because, you know, I'll never dye yarn. I'll never design a pattern. <laughs> I'll never start a YouTube channel. Um, I think knitting, anything creative that becomes a vocation, I, that, I don't know. that. So, because I used to do photography and like not videography, but photography. And then I took that into a business sense 
And I found it very, it took some of the joy away from it. Yeah. So um, I like to just be the maker. I think I really would like to just be the maker. Yeah. And it's funny because like I agree with you and oftentimes people would ask me like, why won't you like if I adjust some pattern or if I'm just coming up with something that's uniquely mine and they're like, are you going to publish it? Is that going to be published design? I'll test mm -hmm. for you. I'll edit it. Like there's all this offer of help, right? And mm -hmm. I'm always comparing it with being a pianist and being a composer. Like there is absolutely mm -hmm. nothing wrong with just being a pianist and never composing a single thing. And there's also nothing wrong with being a composer and not really being the best pianist in the world, <laughs> you know? So to me, it's like the same thing. Yeah. There is certain beauty of just being a maker. Yeah, I, I think so too. And that, again, that sen sense of freedom. Um, I don't feel the need to, if, if I felt like that desire to, to, to do that, I, I would probably follow it. But I just, I just, there's something about just being in bliss and just enjoying the nits and enjoying the fun of it you know that's where it can if it gets rigid it, sometimes I can just suck the joy out of it same with podcasting same with anything same with flying you know the job itself I you have to you have to find your joy in whatever you're doing well you yeah. mentioned a couple of your favorite podcasts when you look at other people's podcasts do you analyze them? Do you analyze their success? Do you try to think of like what they, what you could do differently to recreate that success? Mm. You know, uh, I feel sometimes I wish I was more, more eloquent in how I speak and how I, so I get inspired and I get inspired to try and say less is more. And so that's, that's something that I do. I watch somebody and I'm like, wow, they describe that and everything that, about that project in enough detail without ums, ahs, ands, and, uh, <laughs> and like remembering the names. So that kind of stuff, um, that I do try and strive to be better about. But as far as like emulating, um, I, just, I just have to, to do things my way. And if I see something that is like, you know what, that is that was a really good way of like describing things. I'll, I'll note it and I'll try and like think about it before I film my podcast. And then I turn on the camera and it's all gone. <laughs> it's just like, and I'm like, did I even tell people the needle size I used? Like, yeah, I, I try not, I think comparison is a joy killer. I really do. And that's, I, I'm more of a shoulder to shoulder type person and in, in everything I, I try and do. So I won't say, Oh, that is, that is something that I would want to emulate and attain. It's just like, I'm going to do me to the best of my ability and hopefully get better. And it's fine because like I had this conversation uh, with Hi Fiber Hustle at Ryan back last year when we were at the podcaster hill and there were like all these YouTubers there with their fans. And Chip was like saying like, so where are your people? And I was like, you are my people because I feel like yeah. so connected with the other podcasters. Like, I feel like we are yes. friends. Like I, we, we going through the same thing. We yes. love the same comments. We probably have a lot of the same fans, right? Like mm -hmm. people who watch your channel probably watched mine yeah. as well. And those who leave comments, I often see them on other channels leaving comments. And I'm like, this yeah. is our community. This is our people. <laughs> yeah, it is. And that is, you need those um, other people that are um, the saying, the community over competition is so powerful. And, and I think it's, it's very important to realize that that's, that's the way we all succeed by supporting one another. And if I, I, you know, sometimes people say weird or mean things to other podcasters and we have, a, we, you know, we support one another as as knitting podcasters and i always you know say that like if if you're not making a podcast <laughs> if you don't know how long it takes to figure this out um then i'm not really open to your negative feedback when it comes to stuff like that mm -hmm. and yet um other podcasters will totally get it they'll have somebody say something really strange but as long as it doesn't like you know shut you down if you if it's you know genuine feedback that helps you if they're like the sound was a little bit off or 
I was distracted because he kept touching her hair, <laughs> like <laughs> things like that. I'm like, okay, that is good feedback. I'll try and sit still. Um, but stuff that most of the time is it's really positive. Right. I hope you have that same. Well, what's your favorite thing about having a podcast? It's the motivation, like you said, about like getting out, exploring. It really is. And um, also, when you have a podcast and it's it's become an, uh, a really nicely engaged community where you get the same people commenting, like your people. Right. Uh, and then you just, you know that no matter what, that person's going to be a cheerleader for you. Like, it's it's good. I, I think that is my favorite. It is the feeling. best thing. It is the best feeling knowing that I'm actually adding value. Yeah, I, every time I, I read a comment, first of all, I'm surprised that somebody will take their time to write a comment to me, right? Yeah. But the, it just like it touches my heart every time somebody leaves a comment. I'm like, <laughs> these are my people. That is my absolute favorite thing about it. And I, I didn't anticipate it because I think there was a time when YouTube was quite mean or there was like a lot of trolls and people saying really nasty things out there. So that is my favorite thing. Right. I'm surprised by it is that people genuinely listen and, you know, to leave very specific comments about certain things that are just like, man, that was well thought out. And I appreciate the time and effort that it takes to make a podcast. Right. Well, I told you before we started that without ever speaking to you and without ever having any communication with you, I felt like we were friends. That feeling still with me. I'm so grateful that you agreed to be a guest of my channel today. I'm so grateful that we got to chat and get to know each other. And I hope to meet you in real life sometime. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much, Irina. I'm I'm actually honored to be on your podcast. Like I said, I've watched you and and um I think you're just a fabulous interviewer. You made it very easy. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to put all the information about your YouTube channel in the description of this video. So guys, if you haven't subscribed yet to the Niti Stew, go right now and press that subscribe button over there. <laughs> and don't forget that your comments make us super happy. I sure do. Thanks, Leanne. Thank you for being my guest today. Thanks, Arena.